Great. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about what we're doing in San Francisco as well as across so North America, well across America uh, related to on-site decentralized water treatment systems. Just quickly, uh, where I work, I work for the San Francisco Public Water Utilities Commission. We're a municipal public agency. We provide three utility services, water, power, and sanitation. Um, and we recognized within San Francisco that we really had the opportunity to rethink and reimagine water use in, in new large buildings in San Francisco. San Francisco has a, a number of redevelopment programs, um, uh, projects happening, and we wanted to take advantage of that opportunity to create more water efficient buildings. And we recognize that also that water buildings are actually sources of water. They're water resources um, that traditionally haven't been thought of as, as resources, uh, such as rainwater, stormwater, uh, foundation drainage, which uh, for us in San Francisco is a lot of nuisance groundwater from dewatering operations. Uh, also buildings uh, generate uh, gray water. And in the United States, uh, we commonly refer to gray water as water from our, our clothes washers, bathtubs, showers, and bathrooms sinks. Uh, buildings produce black water, which is wastewater from toilets, uh, dishwashers, kitchen sinks, and utility sinks. And finally, uh, some buildings generate uh, condensate, which is water vapor from uh, air conditioning systems. And again, recognizing we could collect uh, and treat these um, water sources on site and reuse them for non-potable uh, water end uses, such as toilet and flushing and irrigation provided a, a great opportunity. Um, my slide. There we go. Um, but in order to do that and to allow buildings, um, new buildings, both public and private new buildings, we needed to address some of the biggest barriers to on site water treatment systems. And for us, doing research for a few years, we found the biggest barriers were two uh, fundamental issues. One is the lack of appropriate water quality standards, as well as the lack of guidance on oversight and management for ongoing protection of public health. And so in San Francisco, we decided to set out and change this paradigm. And we uh, did a number of things. First, uh, we incorporated an on-site water treatment system in our building. It was an engineered wetland treatment system uh, captured uh, to capture and treat all of the black water that we produced in our building to reuse that water for toilet flushing and irrigation, uh, toilet flushing and urinal flushing within the building. As you can see, uh, par a part of the wetland treatment system shown on the right uh, looks like a series of planter boxes, and that is a part of our, our treatment system. And then we utilize ultraviolet light and chlorine to disinfect that water. We were able to uh, save uh, about 50% of our indoor potable water use. We also, again, wanted to allow other buildings uh, in San Francisco to capture and treat on-site water treatment systems. Uh, on capture and treat alternative water sources for non-potable end uses. We also found a number of private developers wanting to do this as well. They wanted to build green buildings uh, for us in the US to get LEED Platinum rating. But again, we needed to create a program that would be protective of public health. Um, I'm not gonna get into all the details, but it's this interagency partnership between the utility, our Department of Public Health, our Department of Building Inspection, as well as our Department of Public Works. We each play a unique role in the implementation of on-site uh, decentralized water treatment systems. Our program has evolved over time. Uh, so our ordinance went into place uh, in 2012 for a single building uh, to allow uh, buildings like our headquarters to install an on-site water treatment system. In 2013, we went ahead and amended that ordinance to allow for district scale systems where two or more buildings could connect to one decentralized treatment system. We found that that, could be, that is more cost effective and we wanted to allow that opportunity. And then in 2015, uh, in the height of the drought in California, it became a mandatory requirement for all new commercial mixed use and multifamily buildings over 23,000 square meters to install an on-site water treatment system to serve non-potable end uses, mainly toilet flushing and irrigation. And in 2021, we lowered that threshold to 9,000 square meters. Uh, we also uh, require commercial buildings to capture and treat black water because there's not enough gray water supply in a commercial building. Um, and for single family, multifamily, in addition to toilet flushing and irrigation, we added clothes washers as an end use. 
we wanted to ensure that we could we would streamline the permitting process for developers so it was very clear in terms of all the steps that developers need to take um, and again this is a whole program uh, uh, transfers the responsibility of operating these treatment systems from the public sector to the private sector we have a number of projects online today. I'm not going to get into all the details, but we have 45 permitted systems, 29 are planned for the future, and they're different kinds of applications. Uh, the picture in the, in the center is a, a residential building with 550 units. The top right is a state-of-the-art sports arena, and the top left is a district-scale project with 11 buildings, including commercial and residential buildings, installing a black water treatment system. We've also been collaborating across North America, recognizing it's not just San Francisco that has an interest in on-site uh, decentralized treatment systems. In fact, there are systems uh, across the United States. Um, so we formed this uh, partnership in 2012, and it's actually a unique partnership. It's, it was the first time we had the opportunity for public health regulators, both lo local, state, and federal regulators, uh, to work with water and wastewater utilities to discuss uh, the issues and challenges challenges associated uh, with on-site water treatment systems. So we have 15 states as well as uh, uh, Toronto, City of Toronto and Vancouver in our partnership. Our goals are to establish appropriate water quality standards and to promote consistencies among the states in the United States. We also encourage oversight management programs. We develop a number of technical and policy documents, and it's also a forum for peer-to-peer -peer learning as practitioners are able to share lessons learned. And what's very important and what's very critical in terms of an outcome of our work has been to develop a health risk-based uh, framework for these alternative water sources. Uh, prior to this, uh, there wasn't a, a risk-based approach uh, that focused on the pathogen log reduction targets and focusing on the pathogens that created the greatest concern to human health. And those uh, those, this risk, health risk-based framework, again, was really focusing on the health consequences of the exposure of the water uh, with appropriate treatment and monitoring. And the big shift was no longer uh, endpoint monitoring for total coliform to, again, looking at the, the removal of pathogens posing the greatest concern. And what we have found is those pathogens are bacteria, protozoa, and virus. And uh, it, since we started this work, uh, it's been based on an infection-based uh, approach in terms of the exposure, and we've run a number of uh, QMRA analysis in order to determine those uh, LRTs. Um, this table has got a lot of numbers on it, but this is the, the 2017, which is what we established the LRTs for black water, gray water, and rainwater and stormwater uh, for both indoor and outdoor use, focusing again on the removal of viruses, protozoa, and bacteria. And um, really, again, taking those, taking this these numbers and what does that really mean in terms of, of implementation and, and, and practice in the field of on-site water treatment systems. Um, it's really about requiring the appropriate treatment train um, and treatment technologies that will enable the log reduction uh, removal. And uh, along with that is continuous monitoring using microbial, chemical, or physical indicators or surrogate par parameters to achieve that pathogen removal and in inactivation. Um, other goals that we have is, is to also include the reduction of organics um, and nutrients, as well as to ensure that the water is aesthetically acceptable. Um, this whole program uh, is a continuing uh, promoting an ongoing regulatory oversight and management. And just to give you an example, again, taking these LRTs, thinking about this on continuous online monitoring, again, what does that mean in practice? Um, so this is an example for gray water, uh, which really for, for us enable for us to enable uh, the accepted uh, log reduction removals, it's been focused mainly on membrane bioreactors, followed by uh, ultraviolet light as well as free chlorine. Um, as you can see, the each individual technology receives a certain pathogen credit for the various pathogens, um, along with the continuous online monitoring. 
Um, and since 2017, uh, we've had additional data, additional, new science has come, come uh, about. And what we have done in terms of the National Blue Ribbon Commission is we just recently uh, released a publication in 2023 that looks at the additional science um, as well as an additional approach to health risk-based approach. So we have our infection-based uh, benchmark, which we established in 2017. However, we also have had new science looking at, looking at a, a DALI-based uh, benchmark that looks at infections from a different perspective, really about the health impairment uh, resulting from those infections. Um, some states in the United States are moving ahead with the infection-based uh, benchmarks, while others are using the DALI approach. Um, but what, what all that means is, at the end of the day, again, it's very similar treatment trains. This is a very uh, busy slide, but what I wanted to point out is that Fundamentally, if it's going with an infection-based or updated uh, from 2017 or the DALI approach, the treatment trains are fundamentally the same. Um, MBR followed by ultraviolet light followed by chlorine. Um, we have a number of resources that are publicly available. Um, we I share with you the link at the end of the presentation. Again, the document on the right is the health risk-based frameworks, which is the reference I was just making on our most up-to-date information about health risk-based frameworks, uh, the dose responses that were utilized for these different frameworks, uh, and again, getting into more detail. Uh, we also have other other materials available setting how to set up a guide uh, a, a guide to set up a local program we also have sample policy uh, documents and rules and regulations and legislation i, I just want to a uh, few in the last few minutes is just comment on on the market transformation certainly in san francisco as well as in other places we we are starting to see more technology providers coming to the market some of these uh, providers are also indicating the return on, a less, on an investment can be less than seven years. Um, that's really based on these skid mounted treatment systems, again, with this online monitoring and remote operations application. Um, and also some of these treatment systems are starting to incorporate the concept of resource recovery by including things such as heat exchangers and identifying opportunities for nutrient recovery. Additional work is under underway at the National Blue Ribbon Commission. We are working on an uh, operator a certificate program uh, to uh, increase the number of operators. We also are addressing conflicting plumbing codes uh, out it, that's currently out there um, in terms of uh, working with the industry to amend the plumbing codes to align with this concept of the health risk-based framework. Uh, we're also studying the possibility of, of receiving a credit with wetland treatments. We understand that we don't want to just be promoting membrane bioreactors, for example, that we want to understand, certainly in our headquarters and, and other applications in, in the U.S., wetlands can be a very critical uh, component of removing uh, pathogens. And we're also expanding our partnership, our, our National Blue Ribbon Commission, uh, beyond North America. It's open to, to all public agencies. So if folks are interested in learning more, uh, please, please let me know. Um, and, and I want to also just mention an effort that we're doing currently, which is we're looking at single family uh, water reuse applications. Uh, again, we've been focusing mainly on large uh, commercial multifamily and mixed use buildings in San Francisco, recognizing there's still an opportunity uh, within single family. We're looking at uh, potential for recirculating showers, recirculating water and clothes washers, as well as single family gray water systems. We hosted a webinar on October 19th to communicate the state of the science. Happy to share the, the link to that, uh, as well as we are currently in the midst of working with an independent expert panel to assess the feasibility of single family applications. And our vision for the future is really about broad acceptance that on site water recycling systems are just another appliance um, in, in various uh, settings. Uh, we hope that we continue to see market transformation to enable all communities to participate with reduced costs and energy. Uh, we certainly uh, see that improved monitoring uh, through online monitoring can lead to more autonomous systems and to expand uh, resource recovery treatment systems on a decentralized to produce other resources other than just non-potable water, such as energy, nutrients, and drinking water. We actually did a pilot in our building to produce uh, 
to produce water that's comparable to drinking water from our, uh, our engineered wetland treatment system. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to share uh, some of the work that we're doing. Uh, again, we have uh, time for questions and, and comments and discussions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. This is definitely very, very interesting work that you've been doing in San Francisco. And I think it's very much inspiring for many of us here in the room and certainly in other in, in other latitudes as well. Um, please like save the questions in the chat. Uh, we're going to have the, the questions and the discussion after our second presentation. So like this, we can integrate also like the two experiences that we are having right now. Um, so for the moment, uh, I give the floor to Maria. Maria uh, is going to talk about more about the work that they are been doing um, also with multi-source. So Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laura. I'm just going to share my presentation one minute. That's the perfect sound like for like for waiting this type of moment. This is the perfect background sound. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you see my presentation, right? Yes. OK, so it's also a pleasure to be here with you talking like a little bit about our experience here in Brazil and especially about uh, our work with the Multisource project. So uh, complementing with what Paula uh, brought to us, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about uh, water recycling, but focusing uh, on the potential of natural treatment systems for producing recycling water. And also, uh, I'm going to to talk from a risk perspective. So I would like to start with like this first and main question that is that can natural wastewater treatment systems as constructed wetlands, for example, be used for producing recycling water? Um, so we know a lot already about constructed wetlands and in other natural based solutions, but we are not used to to trust those systems. Uh, when we talk about the removal of pathogens and also uh, when we talk about recycling and water reuse, uh, we always, uh, the first thought is always uh, thinking about uh, more technological systems and with uh, aerated systems, membrane systems, and, and so on. So with the multi-source project, we would like to show and to test these nature-based solutions. Uh, of course, that the project the, the project is uh, it, it works in different lines, but our participation in the project is especially for looking for the potential of natural-based solutions to remove pathogens. And uh, with that objective, we are, uh, of course, we are in a in a consortium with another uh, countries, and the different partners in the different countries are responsible for for do the monitoring of uh, these nature based solutions from a microbial risk perspective. So in the multi-source project, there are different pilots and real scale systems that are uh, uh, working and operating for different times. And people is, uh, is monitoring, uh, of course, chemical parameters, but also the consortium is trying to monitor microbial parameters. So uh, from Brazil, we can get this data and conduct some risk assessment and look for the microbial risk perspective. So just so that you know, here, there are some different systems that are being monitored. Uh, each, each country is monitoring 
his own system. So there is uh, a pilot system in France, for example, uh, for from in high uh, a pilot system uh, monitored and implemented by Ritland in Belgium. Uh, another pilot combined sewer overflow system in Italy, uh, implemented and monitored by Iridra. And there is also uh, another pilot in the US uh, that it's uh, implemented by the Montana State University. There are another systems and pilots in, in this big project, but those systems are doing the monitoring of some pathogens and microbial indicators. And also from our side in Brazil, we are monitoring some also some nature based solutions. And I'm just going to show to you some of those systems that we are monitoring in, in the perspective of the multi-source project. So we have, for example, a real scale system that is implemented by an enterprise that it's our partner in the project, that it's Rotaria do Brasil. And it's a real scale system for 40 fixed people and like a lot of clients because this is a big uh, department store. So for this situation, we are monitoring a free vertical flow constructed wetland. We are also monitoring a real scale system of 2000 people and it's a saturated vertical flow wetland. Here there are some pictures and like a scheme of the system. And we are also monitoring a pilot system for approximately 10 people. And in this system, this is implemented in our university, at Federal University of Santa Catarina. And it was implemented and it's operated by um, the laboratory, the group GESAD, that it's with us in the multi-source project. And this pilot system, so it, uh, it, uh, we can study different combinations. So we've been tested the operation of saturated vertical flow constructed wetland or the combination between a free vertical flow plus an, an horizontal flow wetland or a, a saturated vertical flow plus an horizontal flow wetland. So I just would like to give you like this panorama about the different types of systems that we've been monitoring in Brazil and also that the other partners are monitoring in the other countries. In talking about the pathogens, so everyone is used to E. coli as the most usual microorganism that we evaluate to see to track pathogens in, in the systems, also in the environment, of course, but um, it's, it's really usual and it's really easy. Uh, there is an easy methodology to analyze E. coli and it's really established. So of course we are monitoring E. coli, but we do know that it not always represent the behavior of other pathogens, especially from other groups. And especially when we talk about enteric viruses and protozoa. So in, in our project, we propose to use bacteriophage as models for enteric viruses. And we are monitoring uh, different bacteriophages in Brazil and other partners are, are uh, also monitoring these bacteriophages. So just to talk a little bit about the performance of the systems, this is just one parameter that COG. And this graphic is just to show the resilience that a natural based system can have. So here we have uh, the septic tank outflow. So in the systems that we monitor here in Brazil, they all have like a pretreatment system. In most of the cases, there are septic tanks. So here we have the outflow 
in the higher bars, the outflow of the septic tanks that we monitor for the systems that we've implemented here at university. Uh, here are the outflows and here are the outflows of the four different, three different types of constricted wetlands. So here we can see the inflow and the outflow. Since 2015, so we have almost 10 years on, of monitoring and the systems, they, they are really resilient. And the COG removal during the whole period that we've been monitoring is between 75 and 95 percent of efficiency varying uh, between the different types of constructed weapons. Uh, we have been noticing that the saturated vertical flow constructed wetland is it's really like shining and and we highlight the system as a really promising system thinking about uh, recycling producing recycling water and then i would like to show some data here on log reduction values of the different types of constructed wetlands of natural based systems that we are monitoring and and it's good to have uh, paula's presentation first so we can compare like a really technological system as the system with membrane bioreactor and uv and chlorine with natural systems of course there is uh, a difference but we need to think about this difference and how to deal with it and and to have different approaches and to see how we can Im implement these natural systems. And here we can see uh, the monitoring for E. coli and for different for two different types of viruses, for example, here rotavirus and poliomavirus, and the monitoring of bacteriophages. So here we have somatic coliphages and F-specific RNA phages. So somatic coliphages, um, we are looking to somatic coliphages as model models for uh, DNA virus, for example, adenovirus and polyomavirus, and F-specific bacteriophages as models for RNA virus, for example, rotavirus, norovirus, or hepatitis. And here uh, we can see that we have, we do have uh, um, some removal of virus, bacteriophages, and E. coli. And also we can see that we can compare, for example, the removal of uh, RNA bacteriophages and rotavirus. And the advantage of using bacteriophages in, for the monitoring of the systems is that it's much less time consuming and much less expensive than uh, do, doing viruses, enteric viruses. And we can work with viability of the microorganism. And, and, also, and, and sometimes uh, some laboratories and the most common virus analysis, it's based on molecular analysis that uh, and with molecular analysis, it's not always possible to, to, assess, to assess the viability of the viruses in the system. So that's uh, something that we are proposing and evaluating uh, here in Brazil and in the consortium. And here I present the E. coli final, final concentration after each treatment unit. So here we have E. coli concentration for the pretreated pre wastewater, for the saturated vertical flow, for vertical flow and horizontal flow. And here we have the log reduction. Thinking about reusing this water and thinking about achieving best better standards why not to thinking about combination of the systems to to achieve higher removals for example if we combine the saturated vertical flow constructed wetlands and the horizontal flow we can go up to four log removal 
or up to tree log removal if we go for, for example, vertical flow plus constructed flow, constructed patterns. And then uh, looking Sorry, for, Maria, do you for have this three minutes. Sorry? Okay. You have three minutes. Thanks. Okay. And looking for the combination of the systems. Uh, we can we can be really close to some regulations, for example, from World Health Organization. Here we have like ten to the power of four, and we could achieve this with some of the some of our systems that we are monitoring. And so, not just to uh, we should not look just to standards. And we would like also to talk about the approaches of using KMRA, quantitative microbial risk assessment, and the multi-barrier approach that they are both proposed by the, by the WHO and a lot of other um, organizations. Um, so this is uh, just to show that we are going to conduct a quantitative microbial risk assessment with data from the whole consortium of the multi-source system, and we are going to end up with probabilities of infection, distribution curves of probability of infections for different reuse scenarios. For example, we did some, some initial studies and we could get like a 0.05% uh, probability of infection from rotaviruses if we're using the effluent from a saturated vertical flow constructed wetland plus uh, an horizontal flow constructed wetland. If we eat the lettuce, for example, irrigated with wastewater, and of course, like eating at lettuce after washing. And here I point this after washing just to end up with a last approach that I would like to bring, that it's the multi-barrier approach, especially for uh, developing countries and underdeveloping countries and like, like Brazil, for example, uh, we have to think about the whole sanitation chain. And if we account for, for example, this is some experiments that we also conduct and if we apply uh, still like contaminated wastewater into soil and we plant lettuce, for example, we can have up to four lag reduction of E. coli in the soil. So why not to account with that also, uh, looking for this multi-barrier approach? So To close here, we can have, for example, up to four log removal with NBS. We can have another four log, four log removal of pathogens if we count with the soil. We can have another extra log removal if we use protection uh, equipment, looking uh, for farmers, for example. We can have uh, some extra log removals if we apply washing of uh, food, for example, before consuming, talking about irrigation. So the last message uh, that I would bring, it would be, we should look for the whole sanitation chain, especially if we cannot go to like really high technological systems. So in this perspective, NBS can play a, a key role in this uh, looking for this sanitation value chain. And we really like, like the key MRA and multiple barrier approach, and we think we should go for that. And we need, we do need to recycle. And I would say that there is no limiting fact, factor actually. We should map the risks and manage those risks. So the important thing here is, is to know what the risks are. And then we could go for safe reuse, we believe, and counting on NBS systems. So that was my presentation. Thank you again to the opportunity to be here with you.
Thanks a lot, Maria. This indeed is very, very important. And I agree with you, like knowing our risks is, is key to know what are the actions that we can go further. And indeed as well, the reuse of water uh, to prevent these uh, pathogens uh, or to reduce these pathogens as well, like you both were talking about, is very important for us and also uh, for the community itself. So maybe one question, like to start the, 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 the discussion session, and maybe Maria, if you can uh, stop sharing your screen, probably then we, we can see faces from others. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so question for you both uh, first uh, from my side, and then we 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 address the questions in the chat. Um, is to focus in the in 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 with the topic of the governance, like the communities, and also the systems that you were uh, uh, presenting right now. So, what do you think is crucial for the successful implementation of these of these systems, and also for managing those systems? Because we know that there are some barriers, as you were mentioned before. Um, so in both contexts, in the USA and also in the context of Brazil, what do you feel that are all those uh, successful uh, implementation and managing aspects? So who would like to start? I'm happy to jump in. You can go um, on. Yes, um, thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, and I hope that we can coordinate and, and um, work together uh, as is one of my outcomes of hopefully of all of this work. Um, but I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Um, I think, again, for us, you know, we we started this initiative, um, you know, not too long ago. Um, and the critical component was, again, what is the appropriate water quality? What are we really, uh, what do we need to address? And again, uh, the whole traditional approach has been, was just sort of doing the total coliform sampling, the end point um, for, for the water quality. But when we talk about these decentralized treatment systems, certainly in buildings, that water is used very quickly. Um, and we don't have time for the labs to come back to say whether the water, uh, water meets, um, you know, is in compliance or not. So that, that framework just fundamentally didn't work. Um, and then we came up with this pathogen control, again, focusing on, on the most critical pathogens. At the same time, I think we always have to think about how can we, how can we create um, guidance on these treatment systems that make sense and that are practical. And again, uh, our focus has been uh, has been a lot about uh, membrane bioreactors and UV and chlorine because there's available crediting frameworks for these applications. Um, we don't have a lot of crediting frameworks for wetland treatment systems, which is what's so exciting about all the work that's happening here. Um, we've started that work, we've started some of that research, but there's there's more to be done. And I think again, if if we can if we can get to a, a point where, where where public health regulators and our, our, our partners can be comfortable with assigning you know, um, a credits for wetlands, we could have combinations potentially. I mean, our engineered wetland treatment system, we, we you know, we are so proud of that treatment system. We, we, we see it as a public amenity um, and, and, um, and having, you know, uh, certainly when we think about cities, um, having green um, and wetlands and those kinds of concepts incorporated in our, in our infrastructure um, and our settings, it, it's very critical. But, but it, with that, it's the, fundamental understanding what is it that we can remove from these treatment systems in order to be protective of public health. And then comes the oversight and management structures, which which all can be done. Um, and, and I think it's exciting. Again, hopefully we can continue uh, working and collaborating on the research. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yes, indeed. I, I, I one thing that you that you mentioned that resonate with me a lot is the guidance uh, that has to be clear and has to make sense, not just for for uh, the decision makers, but also for the people also to engage with the systems as well. So I completely agree with that. I resonate resonates a lot uh, in my head. So Maria. Uh, I'm. Maybe I would just add something about uh, how to deal with, as you said, the community to engage and to make those systems work. 
and also to to open for like a marketplace actually that's something that that we also we need to learn for example with you in in the us and and we don't have it here in brazil like something really well established and i think that for the decentralized systems we need to go for that and we need to see it, that actually as an opportunity and not as something some system model that it's going to fight with centralized system great thanks thanks a lot yeah definitely um well maybe we are going to start with the questions in the chat thanks a lot for your active participation we have quite a, a few questions here very interesting um so first question um so it's for paula who designed the wetland and who does the operation and maintenance and who pays for the omg or omg great question um so the um, the engineered wetland treatment system is located in our headquarters, so we are uh, a municipal public agency. I just want to also comment, which I don't think I said, is that we promote centralized and decentralized uh, water recycling uh, solutions in San Francisco, so we have both. We don't see it one or the other, we see it as, a, as, as an and. Um, the uh, engineered wetland treatment system was designed by a company called Living Machine, uh, that was a trademark. Um, and um, that was designed originally now, but in terms of operation and maintenance, that's from our own staff. We have our own wastewater operators um, who actually maintain and operate that treatment system. Uh, we are undergoing some modifications to that treatment system uh, as we are going to incorporate, as I mentioned, a permanent uh, permanent treatment system to produce water that's comparable to drinking water in our building. We won't be drinking it. Um, but again, the, that treatment system will be operated and maintained by our own staff. The other systems, I'll just comment uh, in terms of the private sector, the buildings, those systems are designed, operated, maintained by the building itself, by the private sector, not the public sector. We do not get involved in operating those treatment systems in the private buildings. We could potentially thought about it as a business model from our utility, uh, but we don't have the, the staff to do that. So they're all privately uh, managed and operated. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I also uh, in, invite people like to jump in, please. Uh, the idea is to uh, not just uh, use the chat, but if you feel like comfortable, turn out your turn on your camera and please join the discussion. I think like this, we can have like a more chill kind of webinar. Like the idea with these spaces is that it's not a typical webinar that we all been um used to in the last couple of years so please jump in um even if you don't want to turn on your camera please open your mic and and yeah you just ask us whatever you want to to ask in the meanwhile as a meanwhile maybe i will i will reach you the last question that is for maria uh El eloise uh, is asking do you know uh how to explain the difference between between the pathogens treatment by three different types of NBS that you that, that you presented, the difference in physicochemical conditions. Uh, do you have a more in-depth explanation of the mechanisms? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, of course, it's really they're complex systems. But basically, we can identify two main factors, that it's the retention time. So the higher the retention time, the higher the, the pathogen retention and removal. And also the microbial diversity that's created within the system. So when we have, for example, the saturated flow, we have like the dynamics in the system, the different microbial diversity it's it's much higher than in the other systems and those are the the two main factors so so the retention time and all the diversity in in, in the natural system but we are still studying and trying to to look deeper into the differences and to try to explain better Okay, thank you. Yeah, that was just my curiosity. Uh, thank you for your answer. I was I was wondering. 
I'm, I'm really into mechanism and stuff like that. <laughs> I was curious. I don't know anything about pathogens. Thank you for your reply. Thank My you. Presentation. <laughs> But that's the idea, actually, like that even though that many of us, we are not experts in many in, in many um, like work that some of the partners are making or doing or they are developing. So that's the idea with these type of uh, platforms that we ask, even though that we are not experts, uh, me, myself, I'm not one of those, uh, but I'm very, very much into learning this type of um, systems and NBS, uh, the, these new approaches. So would you like, um, like someone wants to jump in, raise your hand if you wanna uh, ask something on top of your head, please do so. Otherwise I can keep on going, like reading, reading the question in the chat. Yeah, Victor, go ahead. Peter? Um, hello, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you all for the for the presentation. Uh, I have a question for Paula, um, and I wanted to know if um, when you try to engage with the community on uh, creating the panel, the advisory panel that you presented, uh, if there was a concern in including different sectors in the in the panel in order to gain kind of the point of view of different uh, different sectors and different perspectives. For example, uh, a private, the private sector would have a different approach to the academic sector and then, yeah. Great, thank you. So um, we've actually had two independent advisory panels. The first was 2017 that established the health risk-based approach. That independent panel did consist of, uh, we had a private sector, we had a public sector, and we had experts in, in QMR, QMRA and pathogens, et cetera. Um, and that's what led to the health risk-based framework. Um, what the independent advisory panel that we're doing currently for single family water reuse applications is only, it does not include any uh, technology vendors or any uh, private sector. It's actually university professors who, whose expertise is QMRA and exposure, uh, as well as some health regulators in terms of regulators who are out there uh, developing regulations and permitting um, and oversight and maintenance and, and, and scientific uh, researchers in the area of, of human health. Um, and the reason why we've done that for this particular independent expert panel is again, is trying to set the fundamental approach about the appropriate health risk-based framework that we should utilize. Um, some of our partners are, are um, from AAVAG in Zurich, as well as the Netherlands, and then the rest of the folks are in the US. So we have tried to, to capture an, an international perspective, um, but we are uh, keeping it uh, in terms of just looking at it from a scientific as well as a regulate, regulatory uh, perspective to understand these applications. The LRTs, I just want to comment on single family. If you watch the state of the of science webinar are very high for these kinds of single family water reuse applications. And I think the, the concern and the issue that this independent panel will be addressing are those the right uh, are right frameworks that we've been using, the traditional infection-based frameworks to establishing these QMRAs, or are there other frameworks or approaches that we could take when it comes to single family? Uh, there's different kinds of exposure for single family than in a commercial building. And so those are some of the questions that they, that they will be uh, analyzing and studying and potentially running new QMRA analysis associated with those kinds of applications. Um, and just to schedule, um, is we anticipate next summer to have a report. But the State of the Science webinar, I'm happy to share that link with, with Laura and other, uh, you know, in terms of other links, if folks are interested in it. Um, I, I think it, it's, it's a very fascinating uh, webinar. We also have slides uh, associated with that. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Alex Vita, for, for the question and Paula as well for, for, for answering. Yes, indeed, if you have any information that you would like to share with us, I'm happy. Uh, and also, I, I think Water Europe is also happy to share this information with the whole consortium and even like to, to, to see if there is a possibility to, to put it in the, in the website. We can, we can check um, which other 
uh, options of dissemination information about this this regard. Um, so yeah, definitely very important. And on that note, uh, you were mentioning as well like to expand um, this initiative with other agencies. So my question here will be like, for example, how how far or uh, how bright this this call will be? Like, which agencies from which countries or what type uh, like of uh, engagement are you are you aiming with with this open call? So we're, we're it's open to anyone in the world. Uh, our our issue our our limitation that we have is that it's just for public agencies and it doesn't include. Uh, product manufacturers. And again, it's this uh, this space where public health regulators, water and wastewater utilities can come together to talk about um, some of the key issues. Um, we've been talking a lot about, you know, establishing the health risk-based frameworks, but there's also concerns, I, I, you know, in terms of from looking at from a utility perspective, who's relying on revenue, who's thinking about their centralized infrastructure and seeing that these decentralized treatment systems are coming into their communities and how do we balance all of those issues. And certainly San Francisco has done a lot of work in that area, as well as other communities uh, looking at, again, why we say centralized and decentralized. There's a role for both of these types of systems in our community. Um, so it, it, um, so it, it, it's open again to all. We have a website. There's lots of resources available that are publicly available. available. Um, we just want to share the work that we've done in terms of lessons learned and, and again, get our information out that could be implemented, um, certainly amended and implemented for the local context. But again, it's an opportunity uh, to share the work that we've been doing. And um, again, we just another plug, if we talking about the wetlands and all the pathogen removal here, we would love to be able to connect on that work and see if we can expand our efforts in terms of looking at uh, pathogen removal for wetland treatment systems. So we could be more proactive in encouraging those kinds of systems within our, within our work that we do. Yeah, definitely. And that is also another another aspect that we that we like to all to all of you in the room, not just between, for example, Maria and Paula, that they of course they they have uh, like a topic in common. And uh, I was very excited like to hear that you both want to uh, work together further and develop new ideas, new projects. That is actually like what we like to have in in this type of conversation, like to see who has like another uh, topic that you have in interest or that you would like to learn with like something like this. That's great. Um, one invitation also for, for, for many of you, uh, if you are not part of the consortium, um, we are having uh, in the next months, um, like a series of these type of webinars. So looking at the time, um, like yeah my, my invitation for 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 is for the next splashdown is going to be in january uh this we have not yet like a a, a, a date like a confirmed date but uh you all will receive an invitation per email and we are also going to use our linkedin uh from the multi-source project so stay tuned uh all the questions that are in the chat um, we are gonna we are gonna collect them, and I will um, forward that to 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 our speakers, and then we we can like this like continue the conversation. So thanks a lot to Maria and Paula. This was amazing conversation, very interesting, um, and yeah, thanks also for the participation, and have a good rest of the day in the continent uh, in the in the continent of the Americas. And here in Europe, um, have a good night and yeah, stay cozy. Thank you very bye much. Bye-bye. Thanks a bye lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you all. Vocês reuniões são periódicas?